I might be biased, but we have a very solid panel on mobile attribution here. From your left to right, we have uh, John Sedlak, Chief Revenue Officer for Placed IQ, David Shim, CEO for Placed, and Steven Rosenblatt, President for Foursquare. Welcome, everyone. We'll try to keep it on time so everyone can have lunch. Um, shall we start with a brief introduction of yourself and your company, and we can pick up from there? Sure, hi. Uh, it's great to be here at Street Fight. Um, I'm Steven Rosenblatt, president of Foursquare, 18-year uh, ve veteran of the digital industry. Um, spent the last about 10 years in the mobile space. Uh, prior to this, built a company called Quattro Wireless that we sold to Apple. And I've spent the last four and a half years at Foursquare b building really the, the leading location intelligence company. Um, you guys probably know us, a lot of you from our consumer apps, but uh, we've really evolved uh, and really what we think about is have the world's largest uh, foot traffic panel that allows us to do a lot of different things, um, including work with about half the ad age uh, top 100 marketers, work with the biggest tech companies in the world, Uber, Apple, Microsoft, Pinterest, Samsung, Tencent, to help them power experiences for their consumers using location. And of course, uh, also uh, have a media business and measurement business uh, where we uh, really pioneered kind of the concept of connecting the digital and physical uh, with real-time uh, daily reports. So a lot, of, a lot, of evolved, a lot has evolved uh, since uh, the uh, consumer apps. I see. How about David? David. Yeah, David Shim, founder and CEO of Placed. And what we do is we connect ad exposures to store visits. So we have about one in every hundred adults in the U.S. where they've actually installed an app on their phone which allows us to persistently measure where they go in the physical world. It's all double opt-in, it's all first party data. We see on average about a thousand latitude and longitude pairs per user per day. And then um, we work with some of the leading agencies out there as well as 200 plus publishers, ad networks and demand side platforms to actually connect those ad exposures to store visits so people can optimize against media for the 90% of conversions that happen offline in the physical world. Hello everybody, uh, so my name is John Sedlak. Uh, as you, you said, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for a company called Place IQ. Uh, I've been with Place IQ for about two years. Uh, just by way of background, before joining Place IQ, uh, I spent about 20 years, 22 years in the, the media business, uh, doing a combination of business development and ad sales at places like AOL, then became AOL Time Warner. Interesting what's happening there these days, right, with, with <laughs> Time Warner and now AT&T. Uh, and then in the late 2000s, uh, 2009, I joined a company called Blue Kai, where we were one of the first uh, aggregators of third-party cookie data, uh, and then made that data available to the market. And that's what gave me the passion for trying to understand the movement toward not cookie data, but unique device ID data. And that's exactly what Place IQ does. So we're a data and analytics company focused on mobile, where our primary focus is to understand uh, the location history and movement of about 100 million uh, unique devices focused here on the United States. So we understand things like somebody who may have uh, uh, high frequency to retailers like a Walmart versus a Target, or if you get your coffee in the morning at a Dunkin' Donuts versus a Starbucks, doing that all anonymously, aggregating the data, and then making it available to marketers to power things like advertising, audience targeting, uh, to power tools like measurement. So after being exposed to an ad on television, online, mobile, uh, did that exposure drive you to the store? Uh, and then also powering things like analytics and technology platforms. So that's what Place IQ does, very focused on mobile data and location in particular. Great, uh, let's get started. So uh, when we are talking about a mobile attribution, where are we at right now? You know, what's happening today? Perhaps we can start with Steven. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, what's, what's super interesting is the fact that we now today have this bridge between the digital and physical world, something we didn't have a couple years ago. And I think the, I, the concept and the, uh, the opportunity, so for the last, you know, 20 years that we've been, you got me beat by, by two years, but about 20 years in, in digital, we've, we've measured online behavior. Right? That's about 7% of the economy. 93% of the economy happens in the physical world. Yet we've had no way to understand whether digital advertising made re a whole lot of impact, um, especially uh, with 
uh, companies that only sell in the physical world. So I think today you have the opportunity to understand, and we do, we have you know, 50 million plus consumers where we actually understand what their behavior is, what, what they're doing around the world to make decisions about that. Everything from predicting things like we did with Chipotle, where before we, they came out with earnings, we said they were gonna be down. They, uh, the, the Wall Street analysts had them down a lot less than, than we predicted, and, and we hit it you know, right on the, the nail on the head. So being able to do predictive analytics based on foot traffic data, the ability to connect digital and physical is something that everyone needs to pay attention to. I think marketers are just getting, getting started with understanding it. Great, how about uh, David? Yeah, I think uh, early days, um, if you think about DoubleClick, Atlas, Seismic, everyone measures ads that they run digitally today. So no one ever goes in and says, hey, I'm not gonna use a third party ad server. I'm not gonna measure that. I just know it's gonna work. And I think you, what you're seeing is for the physical world, when you're trying to capture that conversion that occurs offline, you're kind of going in blind. You're saying maybe click-through rate's the right metric, maybe view-through rate, maybe engagement. But in a lot of cases, there's no correlation at all from someone clicking on an ad to actually going into the physical store. And I think what you're going to start to see is advertisers, agencies, brands start to go in and say, hey, is there another metric that I can look at that is going to give me a better understanding of the impact that the ad has in terms of the physical world? Cool. Well, how about John? So I'll just try to add to what, to what Stephen and, and David said, because I agree with all of it. Um, the, the area where we're focused and where I think you're going to see more companies focused, and when I say more companies, I'm talking about the marketing software companies, you know, the Adobe's, the Oracle's, the Salesforce's, the IBM's, uh, is, is trying to get the buy side of the marketplace. So marketers directly and their ad agencies to recognize that the old KPIs that we were all accustomed to, I mean, click-through being the obvious one, but even site-side metrics to determine whether or not uh, a campaign was successful. I, I, think, I think you're gonna see over the next one to two years an aggressive move toward, uh, for retailers, QSRs, and hotel companies. I'll, I'll call those three out. Those guys still, still have, particularly for retail uh, and QSR, you're seeing between 90 and 95% of transactions happening at the brick and mortar, at the physical location. So why they're always caught up in trying to understand the site side metrics, uh, I think it's gonna, you know, the light bulb's going off more and more for them. Uh, the other thing that's, that's now knowable, that wasn't knowable just a few years ago, because we were so conditioned as an industry in trying to understand consumer behavior based on what people did on the internet, and I admit, I was 100% guilty of that. We spent a lot of time at Blue Kai trying to understand the mouse clicks and where people navigated across the internet. Well, that told us a lot about what someone's preferences were, whether they were in market. I can tell you uh, in, in very certain terms that the, the location signal, where someone goes in the physical world, they burn calories to get there, the time they spend to get there. They use cash in a lot of cases, so they're not, you can't understand that purchase history. It's a whole new paradigm of, of shift with regard to data, that, uh, that we couldn't be more excited about. So I, I think you're gonna see marketers catch up to that more and more. Great, um, I think you all touched upon, you know, the importance of um, bridging online and offline through location data. I'm wondering if you can, you know, uh, give us one or two concrete examples to show um, how much location data, you know, can do. I, I know that Foursquare recently predicted that, you know, uh, the presidential campaign damaged uh, Trump businesses. <laughs> so perhaps, like, you know, each of you can give us uh, one or two examples to show how you do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways, as you said. We, we've been looking at, you know, traffic to Trump properties, and, and we've talked about how we're seeing a significant decline, especially among women, uh, about 21% 20, decline in foot traffic. Uh, at Trump properties. So again, we're able to, you know, we see the world's foot traffic because we have consumers. We're in the consumer business, right? And because we're in the consumer business and we, we, we understand people, we're able to understand, then predict and, and do a lot of the things that we can do today. And another example is on the measurement side, I think we're working with, um, uh, you know, one particular company where they're running, cam they're running uh, a campaign and what we saw was the only day where we saw an increase in sales and foot traffic uh, which really correlated tightly to sales was on Fridays, right? So they're spending money six days a week that we really didn't see a tremendous lift, but Friday stood out is where they really st saw a lift. And so we're seeing now business decisions uh, made 
um, because of that. Last example I'll give is, you know, we also have an intelligence place insights business um, where we are working with, you know, some of the biggest Wall Street hedge funds, and they want to understand, they need to be able to look at data and correlate that to sales. Now, marketers don't do that. Marketers don't you know, are still trying to figure out what questions to ask and what ag the agencies in terms of understanding data. But the Wall Street hedge funds and large tech companies do this analysis and they look to see what data correlates to, to revenue and we're able to, uh, you know, uh, predict uh, foot traffic trends like Chipotle before Chipotle comes out with their analyst reports or, you know, their, their store checks to be able to uh, know wh where, you know, where their sales are, are predicted to be. Yeah, I think from a place perspective, uh, a couple things. So one is we, on Black Friday, we do analysis for a number of retailers where we break down by hour what stores they visit. Uh, the competitive intelligence team before this was available actually had 100 employees go in front of different stores and actually have counters and journals and say how many people are here. They would interview each person and understand what were they waiting for as they were going into the store. What we did was we actually narrowed that down to know people directly measured our audience going into the stores by hour. They overlaid the different sales that were going on for each one of their competitors to see what was actually spiking. So not being limited to just taking action on Black Friday, but actually taking that to the rest of the week. Uh, holiday shopping season. So you can see when is the best time to actually reach the person, what are the products, what are the deals that are really resonating. And on the flip side, on the measurement side, uh, there's always saw an ad, one in the store, that's table stakes. You need to do that now. If you've got an offline business, you need to measure the offline portion where it's, do they see an ad, do they go in the store? But I think there's a secondary portion to say, what did they do in the store? What did they actually convert on? So we work with about eight out of the top 12 QSRs in the US where they go into the store or they go in the restaurant, and that's great. They went in, they went to McDonald's, they went to KFC, they went into Taco Bell. But they want to know, did you buy the menu item that was actually being purchased? Because over 50% of the US population goes to one of those QSRs, so they want to be able to close that loop. So from a measurement standpoint, we're seeing a lot of that closed loop action go in to say, what's next? How do we actually build that out further? So, so I'll speak to a holiday example since we're about to enter the, the holidays here. So for the past two years, we've been asked by uh, one of the largest retailers in the United States, uh, and in fact, they're number one or number two largest ad spender in retail. So not necessarily the most number of stores by physical location, but they spend a lot in marketing. Uh, so about this time last year, they asked us, or they told us, they said, hey, it's really interesting. Uh, right around Black Friday, we see, a f we see that there's our core customer base, people who are most frequent visitors to our brand, all of a sudden, starting on Black Friday, begin to abandon us, right? So they're, some of their most loyal customers stop going to their store, and, and they're like, we have no idea where they're going. We can guess, but we have no idea. So we did a look back to understand, okay, for people who had a high frequency visitation to that retailer, where did the, that subset of audience, where did they start to, where were they a flight risk? And we found out that there were three or four retailers who were perhaps an even, uh, uh, higher quality brand, let's say, retail brand, than this already reasonably high quality brand was. And we realize it's, it's likely because when you're putting a gift under the Christmas tree and you're buying for that special loved one or you're buying for somebody who is at least reasonably important to you, it's always nice for it to have the Tiffany color box or the higher end premium box. And it was obvious in the data that they left this already reasonably premium retailer to go to these other guys who are much, you know, arguably higher end luxury. The next step of the data that we, we then uh, analyzed was, since we know where these devices live in aggregate, we can connect each device ID to the third party data that's connected to those households anonymously. So now I can understand what other third party attributes are connected to these device IDs. What kind of cars do they own? What sort of CPG brands do they have an affinity for? Uh, what, what lifestyle characteristics? Where do they like to go on vacation? And it, it allowed this retailer to understand a lot more about this, uh, that, that subset of consumers. Cool, thanks everyone. Uh, so Steven, I think you <laughs> mentioned something very interesting. You mentioned that you know, like agencies, agencies are trying to figure out what questions to ask. So it seems like a mobile attribution is um, comparatively new concept for uh, marketers and agencies. So how do, this is a question for everyone, so how do uh, you or your sales team sort of have that type of conversation, mobile attribution, you know, with agencies and uh, brands? Well, I think there's two parts to that. One is just educating on the space and the fact that this exists and, 
and the idea that you know you are probably measuring uh, media or evaluating media in a very 2005, 10 way in terms of you know cookie-based measurement and. I think, you know, as John said, you know, in, a, in a world where you can actually see on a one-to-one -one basis uh, and you can measure what's going on in the physical world, there's, there is a better way and a new way to, to look at things. Also, there's always been a gap in the funnel. There are companies at the very bottom like Data Logics that uh, are great at tracking purchase and behavior. And then there's, you know, the Nielsen's and the Comscores and many others that have done, you know, brand awareness and purchase intent uh, metrics. And now there's kind of that, finally you can, kind of close the gap. So I think it's, there's a lot of educating I think we all do on the space. Um, I, I'd say then it really comes down to there's a lot of noise in, in location and there's a lot of companies I think that need to be way more transparent with data collection and the apps they're in and the SDKs that are out there and you know marketers and agencies should not accept that we have an NDA with a, a company or it's confidential or I can't share that. You know, I think we, we got in a mess in this industry around viewability years ago and lots of click fraud in digital advertising and now we're trying to clean it up and we can't get in the same mess with location data. So it is critical that everyone, it's time for everyone to get transparent about what is possible, what they actually can do. Um, and for us, because we're, you know, we've had to, we've built consumer apps, something incredibly hard to do, We've had, you know, we don't, there's no black box algorithm in terms of how we get our data. It's very clear. We get it from, you know, our consumer apps and from our partners, and I just named, you know, a bunch of them uh, and about 100,000 other, you know, developers that use our API, which we'd be happy to share. So, again, I think it's time for this industry to start to be more open, more transparent, and educate about data quality and what's, what's possible while also educating about the space. How about David? Yeah, I think education's huge. Um, We've been educating for, and you know, Place IQ has been in space for us for a long time. Like, education's been a really uphill battle up until, I want to say, in the last year. I think agencies have actually started to turn around and say, okay, we need to measure this. There's more RFIs going out. There's more questions about what's the location accuracy? Um, how do you actually get the data? What's the privacy policy? Where else can I use it? So they're getting a lot smarter in terms of the questions that they're asking from an agency standpoint. Uh, to your question around, you know, how do we handle it from a sales perspective? How do we tell that story? Uh, high level, it's really, we focus in on measurement only. So we don't sell media, we don't sell targeting components around cookie or device ID. So it's helped from our perspective is just to be a very kind of clean story to say, we measure where people go in the physical world. We work with great partners like Verve, uh, as well as some others in the audience as well. So we're able to actually measure that ad exposure store visit, and we're able to give a common currency. Because that's the one thing that we push really aggressively is making it actionable. And I think all of us will talk about actionability, and that's the most important part. Because if I just give you a report, and you don't do anything with it, it's like, that's great, but I'm gonna do this quarterly, I'm gonna use it like dynamic logic or something else. You want them to actually take action where it's like, hey, here's a geofencing strategy. Here's where else they go. This is how you wanna target them so you can drive better performance. And for us, our take has been, we wanna be that independent third party. So, so the way we look at it, it, and fortunately for me, I got to know the place like you guys pretty well before I joined the company. I got to know them through my Oracle engagement with them. Uh, so for folks who've been in the data business uh, for at least five or six years, some folks may remember, uh, I remember vividly, it was the summer of 2010. The Wall Street Journal did, a, did a, uh, a, a series of articles. It was like every week, it was like just pounding, pounding. It was called, Did You Know? Anybody remember this, this series of articles? Nada remembers, right. So the Did You Know, it was called an expose. And you know, the Wall Street Journal, you know, sort of high integrity reporting, uh, does this expose, and the whole theme of it was, did you know uh, that people are tracking your cookie behavior, right? And I think it changed the world. I honestly feel like that's when uh, organizations like the NAI, DAA said, okay, we are all on notice now as an industry, and we have to make sure that every, every piece of data that we collect is done in a transparent and privacy compliant way. Uh, so I went through that four or five years of making sure that at a company like Blue Kai, we didn't screw that up, because if we screwed that up there, our entire valuation would have cratered. Uh, Join Place IQ, um, happy to say, and, and also I, I think I'm with, uh, in good company here, where there are, are really good companies who are collecting data the right way. Double opt-in, right? You opt in on your phone, the form factor. You're given the opportunity to toggle yes or no 
I'll allow my, my location data to be collected. You're given the opportunity again in the app, right? So that's double opt-in. You want people to have notice and transparency uh, about whether or not the data is being collected. Otherwise, the whole thing craters. Uh, I agree with, with, with Stephen that there are companies, uh, unfortunately, in the ecosystem that we operate who are, uh, who are let, let's just say, you know, not necessarily doing it the same way. And I think that's a bad thing for us as an industry because when IBM or Comscore or Nielsen or Oracle and Salesforce come along and they look under the hood of how these companies are collecting data, you better have a good story to tell. And if, it's not, if you're not collecting it the right way based on the standards that I just described, you can forget about whatever equity you're trying to build in your company. Uh, so we look at that as being a really important thing. And I guess my other add-on to that would be you know, I, so I, I do think that companies like the ones I mentioned, and then within the measurement discipline in particular, right? So there are online to online measurement and attribution companies. I know this panel is about attribution, right? So the visual IQs, the odometries, the market shares, these are companies who I also think are doing it the right way, but they're missing the location signal. They're, they don't fully understand the movement from online to offline. And I think there's an opportunity for companies like us to help them do it right. John, I, I just say, you know, just to add, I think it's beyond the Salesforce, IBMs, I think for sure, but I think marketers, you know, they are starting to, and we're seeing pockets of really smart, sophisticated marketers yeah. who know how to dive into the data and truly look at their own data, their own traffic, foot traffic data, and match that up to yours to see if the signals align, yep. right? And, and uh, I think that's what you're going to start seeing, sophisticated. I mean, the people on Wall Street, these guys are trained data scientists, the smartest and the best to analyze the data in ways and see how that correlates, what you're saying correlates to sales. That's, that's the holy grail. If you pass that test, you're in good company. So I think marketers, you know, the first thing, these companies will crumble when marketers start to really dig under the hood and analyze their own data, credit card data, spend data, what they see against your data set, and when, when it doesn't match up, you're, you're screwed. And I, and I agree, the, the hedge fund sector in particular, right, which is a burgeoning sector for all of us on stage, those guys are making multi-billion dollar recommendations based on the data that we're helping provide. You know, gone are the days where they're hiring, uh, you know, two, two prop planes to fly over a Walmart parking lot to figure out, you know, on Black Friday, to figure out how many spaces are empty, and then doing a notebook calculation. There are, they're using companies like, like ours to figure this out, and I think it's a good thing. And drones. <laughs> and, and some drones. <laughs> Great. I want to push it back a little bit. You know, like, uh, obviously, you know, like, you all, you all have uh, different methodologies. So what type of location data are you primarily working with? Uh, for us, like I said, it is, there, there's, uh, Three, three ways, super transparent. If you want to have any questions about our data, go download Foursquare and Swarm, our consumer apps. That is the backbone of our data, right? We have 10 billion check-ins, 10 billion times someone has told us that their phone is at a particular place, whether it's you know, the seventh floor of a building where, uh, or the 10th floor where we're at, on the third floor in our building where there's an Equinox or the first floor there's an Armani Exchange. We're able to not only correct for inaccurate data that's coming from the hardware, we've captured over the last several years all the sensors of those particular venues. So we have 105 million venues and those sensors, I mean the Wi-Fi sensors signal, the Bluetooth, the beacons, 100 million Wi-Fi signals appended to our data. So we have our own stack. We don't license venue venues from a third party. We've built our own homegrown uh, venue database based on how the, the phone actually sees the world. Um, we also collect data passively. It's again an agreement with our consumers to be able to give them that delightful experience when they, they stop at a place for us to wake up and understand that their phone is at something relevant. We built technology to know when a phone is stopped. So we see the average consumer stops at four to five places a day, right? I don't think you stop at you know hundreds or thousands of places a day. You stop at four to five places a day, right? And so we know when that phone is stopped. Mm -hmm. We collect that, and then a lot of the partners, like I said, we get um, signal back right. from the venue. When you geotag a tweet, if you do that, if you tweet here about Street Fight Summit and you geotag the location, it's going to call the Foursquare database mm -hmm. as an example. So that's yeah. that's our data. There's cool. no other. 
Yeah. No, nothing heavy. <laughs> How about David and John? You know, we may need to speed up a little bit. We don't yeah. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Place, we do a couple different ways. So one is we've got three owned and operated apps. Uh, first app is called Frequent Flyer. Street Fight covered the launch of that. So we actually give you airline miles in exchange for letting us measure where you go in the physical world. So very clear value exchange. Gets us leisure travelers, business travelers. We spend, with across those three apps, by the way, uh, over $4 million a year on recruitment. So we're spending on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, where we're going after specific demographics, geography, audience segments. Uh, the second app is called Panel App. We pay you directly, so think of it more like Nielsen or Comscore. And the third is Give to Charity. We actually make a charitable donation for letting us measure where you mm -hmm. go. And then we've got one other section where it's placed affiliate, where we work with third-party apps where they actually go in and say, a premium feature in app is free if you're willing to trade your location data. If you want an ad-free experience, trade your location data. And Place covers the cost of that. So when a user is actually going in, it's a direct value exchange. Yeah. Cool. John, can you sum up your methodology? You want me to go yeah, fast? You want to go yeah. fast? You said you. Okay. All right. So two two layers of data. From, mostly, when people ask the data question of us, I think of us collectively, they're asking about the device IDs, where you're getting them from. But let me answer that second. The first uh, data set that's really important for the use cases that we're talking about is what what Stephen alluded to is this base map. Uh, that that's an incredibly proprietary asset that companies like us need to invest in and constantly refresh. So in our case, we've got a base map that has identified the lat longs that are associated with every retailer, every QSR, every car dealership, every golf course, every state park. So as you see a device move across physical space, it's constantly building a behavioral profile based on the places it visit and the time spent at those places. So that's one data set. The second data set that's critically important is where are you getting the device IDs from? So for us, our strategy is privacy compliance, so double opt-in, getting it from a combination of uh, app partnerships directly, the ad call ecosystem, app partnerships where we're getting both foreground and background data. So for folks who, who are newer to the, the mobile space, foreground means you're in, the, you're in the app, you get to see that device when it's in the location. Background is, if you look at your privacy settings in your phone, you want, when you go to a mapping technology or a, a map app or a, a weather app, you don't want to wait for it to load, right? So you give it the ability to always know where you are for that convenience. So more and more Place IQ is relying on data sets like that as well. Cool. Now, like, um, are there any questions from our audience? We're, we only have like around two, two minutes. Two minutes left. and 45 seconds. <laughs> any questions? Oh, we have a question over there. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. I have a question for the Foursquare guys. Um, I am in New York, and I can use Foursquare to check in when I go to the gym or to the club or somewhere I'm proud of. But if I'm a, if I sell diapers, I don't check in when I go buy diapers or when I fill up my tank necessarily. So how do you solve that problem? What's your name and what company do you work for? <laughs> <laughs> my name is Mark. I work for Waze. For Waze? Yeah. Okay, cool. I like Waze. Um, and, and you use our data, actually. I don't know if you knew that, to power a lot of the things you, you guys do. Yeah, we use you guys for search. So, um, so uh, one of the things, again, that we've built is that passive you know, background technology that understands where you are. So the agreement, obviously, you double opt in with our, you know, and, and many ways to opt out with our consumer apps. But when, whether you check in or not, and that's the thing that we built a couple years ago, we still know where you've stopped. Right, we know we, we have that background location, that stop detection that understands when to wake up and knows uh, if your phone is stopped, we read all the sensors on the phone. So again, I don't know that you bought diapers, um, but I do know if you're at CVS, Target, or Joe's Drugstore, whether you tell me explicitly or whether, you know, again, because we've built this, the, we've got enough data, enough sample from, you know, 10 billion check-ins, over 50 million users, seven and a half years of history to know the sensors of that particular place by now. Um, so if you buy diapers, I guess David can ask you that question. So, so we, 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 in aggregate, we do know whether they bought diapers. And not, not that day, right? Not to freak anybody out. So we definitely do not know the minute you bought it. We're not getting receipt data at the instance, at the, at the instant. Um, within typically 30 to 60 days, we're, we're connecting that device ID to a parcel ID, then using a third party to connect the parcel ID to a home address. So if Datalogix has uh, CPG data on that home address, 
there's a way to there's a way to connect that, and CPG companies are doing it all the time. Uh, I think we don't have any more time for questions, but uh, I think uh, you guys will stay around, right? Like, the, if you have any questions, yeah, you can just grab Steve, David, uh, Steven, David, uh, John, and thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your thoughts Thanks on mobile you. education. Thank you.